Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Do you have a lot of stuff, a lot of things? Do you have great possessions, to use the words from our gospel reading today? Maybe you don't think so. I remember when I first moved to Akron, Ohio to take my first call from the seminary. I'd never owned a house, but I had just enough stuff where we needed a truck anyway, and my parents helped me get my stuff where it needed to go. And as my dad was helping me unload the truck, he said, Adam, you should cherish the fact that this is only half full because it will be the last time that will ever happen. Because he knew that once you have a house, you just have a habit of accumulating stuff. And similarly, at my first call, we had a rummage sale every year. And you're always wondered to yourself, is there going to be enough to have one every year? And there always seemed to be enough stuff to fill most of our church and be bought by others. That's sort of what we do in America. We get stuff. We accumulate lots of things. To the degree that when you think about or you ask a young person to think about life before cell phones and 18 different pairs of shoes and 30 different pairs of clothing, it's even hard for them to imagine how people could have lived that way. Or another way that people think about this topic is they'll ask themselves the question, what would you do if you won the lottery? Or what would you do if you had a million dollars? All that money. Surely, that's going to make you happy. You'll be able to buy all the things that you can think of right now that you want with money left over. Maybe some of those pictures I showed the kids, right? You could get that big house that would have everything you thought you would ever want in a home. Or the car that you can think, you know, I'm gonna, at least for a while, I'm not gonna have to worry about fixing anything on it. It's gonna run smoothly and I have enough money to fix it whenever something does go wrong. I don't have to worry about budgeting and all of that stuff. Well, maybe it's not stuff, maybe it's not the possessions, or at least what we normally think of as possessions. Maybe it's worldly authority, maybe it's lots of friends, maybe it's influence and expertise that we strive after. But by the definition that Christ is using in our gospel reading, those things too are possessions, things that which we think we earn that belong to us, that give us a sense of safety and peace and security. And we would be lying to ourselves if we didn't admit that we're often tempted to think this way, and we often do think this way. If only we had this or that, then things would be great. If only we had a little bit more of this or a little bit more of that, our problems would melt away. And it's a strange thing, isn't it? Because some part of us knows that isn't true. There are so many examples that we can all think of of people who seem to have it all, but their lives are lives of misery and emptiness. And some part of us understands that just having $100,000 in the bank doesn't mean our problems are going to go away. But we like to think that our fate lies in something that we can earn, that we can accumulate, that we can control and have in case we need it. So what is that thing for you? What is it that often catches you off guard into thinking, if only I had this, life would be fine. My problems would go away. The one thing that if you had it, you'd think, I'm good to go. We all have something, and it probably has changed throughout our lives, but we all have something. For the child, it might be the pair of jeans that everyone else at school has, and I know my parents won't buy them because they're $70, but i got to figure out a way to get them, because if I get them, everything will be good. Maybe it's the car or the house, 
Maybe it's getting into a certain school or a certain school program. The list is endless of things that we think if we simply acquire them, our problems will melt away. Well, our Old Testament reading and our Gospel reading both deal with the things of this world. Another word that we often use to describe all of these things, which I have said, is possessions. And I like that word because it gets to the heart of why we like that stuff, because we can possess it, because we can own it, we can control it, we can use it for what we think is best. But the Bible has some surprising things to say about striving after that stuff. In Ecclesiastes, the preacher describes the pursuit of possessions as a striving after the wind. Now, that phrase is to denote that it is an empty, futile pursuit. I don't know if you've ever tried to go after the wind or grab onto it, but it's a hopeless exercise, and that's what he's saying here. The fruits of your toil, when you really think about it, are a hopeless exercise. You might as well be trying to stretch out your hand and grab on to the wind. And the reason specifically that he says that it's fruitless, because you might be thinking, well, but it's nice to have a house when it's really hot with air conditioning or really cold uh, with heat and be sheltered from the weather. And of course, you would be right, but the, the writer of the Ecclesiastes says, yeah, but what about when you die? He says that it seems to be a striving after the wind because when you die, those things go to somebody else. And that somebody else didn't earn them through the sweat of their brow as you did by applying your wisdom. It's just handed to them. Just a vain activity, a striving after the wind. And in Luke's gospel account for today, Jesus gives a specific example of this life of striving after the wind. A rich man in pursuit of more stuff, more possessions. And one might read all of that and think, why bother? What's the point? God Himself is saying that it is a pointless exercise to strive after all this stuff. Why make any effort? Why bother? What's the point? The question seems to hang out there. If it's all eventually going to go away, what is the purpose of all this effort that I'm engaging in? What's the purpose of accruing money or buying the house? Or even what's the purpose of raising offspring and having a family and having friends and accruing authority? For when I die, it's all gone. Well, it would be that case if Jesus doesn't come into the picture, but fortunately for us, Jesus does show up. And Jesus doesn't just rebuke the way of living that strives after possessions. Because if that was all he said, then it would lead to despair. Why bother? Why get out of the bed in the morning? But Jesus doesn't simply rebuke this way of living. He offers a new way. So let's look at the gospel reading to learn what this new way is. So how does our reading begin? It begins between a dispute on inheritance between two brothers. By today's standards, the inheritance laws of the ancient world were definitely unfair. If you were the firstborn son, you got a lot, and if you weren't, you didn't get very much. And so, the assumption is that the brother who's complaining is not the firstborn, and he wants this teacher to talk about the law in order to convince his brother to give him more of his share of the inheritance. And this wouldn't have been an abnormal question. The rabbis frequently weighed in on the issues of earthly law and applying God's wisdom to it. And so it's not a rude question for him to ask. It's pretty normal, and most people would have thought it was normal. But it's Jesus' response to that question that is out of the ordinary. 
because Jesus is going to inform them that I'm not a rabbi. I'm not merely a rabbi. I'm not here to talk about earthly disputes. And he says this with, pretty, uh, with a pretty sharp rhetorical question. He says, man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? In other words, I didn't come here to talk about that or teach about that. That's not why I was sent. He's come for another purpose, and Jesus is informing the questioner and the crowds that this is not what He's come to talk about. It's not what He's come to give. And so Jesus then immediately moves on to address the issue for which He has been sent, not issues of earthly laws and disputes over money and inheritance and wealth and possessions, but rather the human heart. In this case, the attitude that one should have regarding the place that possessions play in the life of a person. And he says so by saying this, take care and be on your guard against all covetousness. Now, covet's kind of an old biblical word that we don't throw around too much these days, and so we often sort of equate it with wanting things, but that's really not the full understanding of covet. One of the definitions people give is a strong desire. It's also equated with lust, the lust for things, but it's really wanting something that God has not given to you to the degree that you will pursue it yourself. And it doesn't matter to you whether it belongs to somebody else or maybe that you shouldn't have it, but you must have it. That's coveting. So why be on guard? Well, Jesus answers this question. He says, because one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Now, this would have been a really stark thing to say in the ancient world, even more so than today. Because in the ancient world, your possessions equaled your security from the struggle and suffering that life inevitably brings. It's how you purchased food, it's how you're able to have a home, all of those things, which are still true today, but the stakes were often higher in the time that Jesus was alive. So saying that one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions would have perked up the ears, and maybe it still does perk up your ears today. So this sets us up a parable that Jesus is about to tell. He says this parable about the rich man, the rich man who has a lot of stuff already, but it's not quite enough, which we know is pretty true. Once you have enough money that you think you're good to go, well, then it's always a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. That's the definition of greed. So the rich man, his crops produce plentifully, but he doesn't have anywhere to put all of this stuff that he's accumulated. So what does he do? Well, he asks himself, which is a key phrase here, he asks himself, what shall I do? And what does he decide to do? He tears down the old barns because they were insufficient to house his wealth, and he builds bigger ones. He asks himself what to do. He's looking to his own wisdom here. He's looking to his own knowledge of the world and comes to a fairly rational conclusion. If I don't have enough room to store things, then I should build more room so that I can store it. But then after he does that, he sits down, right? Maybe you can imagine like after you've put in a really long day's work or you've done a, you know, a physically demanding house project or landscaping, you sit down and you, ah, you know, right? You sit down, you're at peace, and he's looking around and, and notice that the, the word here changes. He's no longer asking himself, but he asks his soul, I'm at peace. I'm content with what I have, right? So he says here, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. So it's no longer a satisfaction or a contentment with his physical life because he's talking to his own soul. 
he's completely at peace with himself. And so this is the ending that those who strive after possessions, who believe that life is all about possessions, seek to have, right? To have all of enough of the stuff that they need, no more worries. I can be at peace. I can be content. I can relax and enjoy the fruits of my labor. But what happens? God shows up. And the soul he was just speaking to is now required of him. And the words of God are harsh. Fool. Fool, this night your soul is required of you. And the things that you've prepared, whose will they be? Think about this for a moment. Maybe take an inventory of your own life. After all, Jesus here is inviting us to consider our life with the knowledge of our own inevitable death. What are the things that you've prepared to find security and peaceful contentment in your life? Maybe you're like the rich man and you've accrued great possessions. Maybe it's something else. But whose will it be when you die? And he concludes the story with, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So if the life, if my life and your life and the life of all the people listening to Jesus doesn't consist of possessions, what does it consist of then? If all of this stuff is a striving vainly after the wind, what am I supposed to do? Am I supposed to think that all possessions are bad? Should I not want to have money or save my money? Should I not invest in buying a home? Should I not have children and raise children and desire these good blessings for them? Well, of course not. God does intend all of those things to be good blessings to you. But look at what Jesus says before he begins the story. He's encouraging the listeners to guard against all forms of covetousness. He wants you to guard your heart. Because he knows your heart and mine. He knows that we are drawn to these things. And not drawn to them in the way that he wishes, but in the way that we wish. We want to be able to possess the thing that will bring us security. We want to be able to earn it, to control it, to hoard it, and keep it for when we really need it. Earthly reputation, fitting into the norm of the world, earning lots of money, saving up for a rainy day, the list goes on and on. All of these desires, God knows, can and often lead us to think, this is what my life consists of, getting up and going to work raising the kids, making sure we have what we need, advancing my career, gaining authority or power or expertise in my field, and then going to bed and starting all over again. But Jesus, your Lord and Savior, is saying to you, your life is about much more than that. It's about much more than all that stuff the phrase he uses is about being rich toward God. But you might wonder, how, what does that mean, and how does that work? I understand how to be rich in this life, right? I've got to put my nose to the grindstone and put in the hours and do the work and earn the money. But how do I become rich toward God? What does that, what does that mean? Do I have to earn that too? Do I have to follow rules and, and, and put my nose to the grindstone in a different way? Well, learn from the rich fool. Who does the rich fool look to for wisdom and counsel? He looks to himself. He thinks he has all the answers of life within himself, and so he asks himself what to do and how to guide where he should aim the purpose of his life. 
But Jesus is calling for a different way, not to look in upon yourself, but to look to God for wisdom and counsel. After all, your life consists in more than your possessions. This is what you're doing here this morning. We're looking for that new way. We're looking for Jesus to tell us how to live, what to do, what does our life really consist of. And what does he have to say? He's here to remind you that you were made in the image of God. Before any sort of earning begins, you have intrinsic value in his sight. He loves you and had plans for you before you were even in your mother's womb. He saved you through his death on the cross and his resurrection from the dead. This forgiveness bought with his blood, this renewed spirit of God which he has given freely, As a gift of His grace, this redeemed eternal life is yours, not because of your own toils and the fruits of your labors, but because of Christ. Not your striving or mine, but because of His striving and His alone. You see, you are rich toward God. This is the message of the gospel. It's the unbelievable aspect of it that strikes to the heart of the issue. Your riches are not of this world, nor are they based on your own efforts. I hate to break it to you, but in fact, this is good news. You can't earn it. You can't put your nose to the grindstone and make it yours. You can't control it. You can't accumulate it and save it for when you think it's best to be used. But all that, which seems at first to be terrible, is actually good news, because it turns out that you don't have the answers, that you don't have the wisdom and counsel necessary to encompass what your life actually consists of. And so it is given freely from outside of you, from God through Jesus your Savior. You are rich toward God. And your riches are not merely of this world. They are riches that are eternal. And they are the fruits of our Savior Jesus' work on the cross, given for you. So think again about your life. What is it that you have set aside in preparation? What is it that you have placed your security in? What is it you think your life consists of? For the rich fool, when the hour of his death arrived, he heard fool from God. Will you? You will not, for you are rich toward God as a gift of love and grace from Jesus. So that when your time comes, be it today, tomorrow, or long in the future, You will not hear fool, but rather you will hear hear, well done, good and faithful servant, not because of anything you have done, but because of all that Christ has done for you. And as our epistle said, your life is now hidden in Christ, in this life and the life to come forevermore. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.